Home gyms are very popular these days, and let me tell you, as a coach, I have seen some truly terrible ones. If you're looking to build one from scratch or you wanna upgrade yours, let me help save you a giant headache and some money on episode 269 of The Drop Set. Let's hit it. What's up, everybody? Thank you for joining me. Darren Starr here once again. Episode 269 of The Drop Set. Holy crap, this podcast has been going on for eight years. Wow. Um, to those on YouTube, thanks. Hi. To those listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, CastBox, Stitcher, or any other of the 15,000 apps out there that you can listen to podcasts on, hi. Hi. How are you doing? You know, I went through great pains to make sure this podcast was on Amazon podcasts. And so far, um, my uh, analytics, at least, show that no one is streaming it on Amazon podcasts. So time well spent. That's what I always look to do. Be as efficient as possible. So we're going to talk home gyms today. Oh, yeah. Websites, fivestarphysique.com, fivestardigital.com uh, on social media, Instagram, for me personally, at Darren underscore star, the show at the drop set podcast on TikTok at Darren underscore star. That's a thing, apparently, that the kids are doing these days. What else? Let's go. Uh, why would you want a home gym? That's a question that I ask a lot myself. Personally, I'm not a fan, which makes it seem like, well, Darren, why are you doing this episode then? I work with a lot of clients who have one and prefer it. And while I think it's a little weird, okay, that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, preferences, you know takes all kinds. Uh, I always thought it wasn't for me. And then the pandemic hit and the gyms closed and I was forced to build a home gym. And I built a pretty good one in a pretty short amount of time. I invested quite a bit in it and realized, yeah, I hate this. I hate it. I absolutely hate it. This is not for me. Couldn't wait for gyms to open back up again. Um, and once they did, eventually I just sold everything I had. <laughs> I had wanted no part of maintaining that as a regular way to occupy space in my house. Absolutely not. No way. So um, the thing is, though, a home gym can be very convenient. It can have no people in it outside of yourself, which is great, um, but it still needs to be really, really effective and without really compromising a whole lot. With a commercial gym, it's loaded with all the equipment that you might possibly need. When it's your own space, obviously, every single thing that you add to that is quite an investment that's coming out of your pocket. You're not paying a monthly fee, but you've got a big initial expense, and those expenses can keep piling on if you want to upgrade this space over time. Um, the, what I would ask people here is, is it right for you? And part of that is knowing your personality type. And clearly if you've already got a home gym set up, like I'll put a timer, I'll, I'll put a timestamp in here. You can skip ahead, um, to the recommendations. Uh, but if it's, if it's something that you're considering, I would just try and understand your strengths and weaknesses a little bit. Um, for me, uh, I'm a diva, I'm an equipment snob. And so residential grade equipment is lower quality and like I feel it when I'm using it and it drives me nuts and I hate it. And at the some of the gyms that I go to now, there are pieces in each of those gyms that feel a little bit more residential grade and I stay away from those as well. Like I'm always trying to find the highest quality machinery that I can use other than, you know, free weights, which if it weighs the right amount, that's great. That's all we really need. Um, but when it comes to actual machines, and again, the older I get, the more machines I rely on. I do less and less free weights and more and more machine stuff here. So the quality of the machine matters a lot to me. Um, another thing would be budget. Like if you're a penny pincher, a home gym might just not be a great setup for you. Like it's going to cost some money to get a, a good facility set up for sure. You're going to have a pretty sizable initial investment. And realistically, that's, you're probably going to continue to invest in it over time as well. Um, do you find yourself getting distracted at home? That's another thing to consider. Uh, if you have kids at home, like you may need to stay there and work out, but also like, you know, are they going to be interrupting your workout? I've received videos from people in the past, um, where they're showing me a form video on something and their little toddlers walking into frame. And I'm like, that's kind of dangerous to be honest with you. Plus 
you're not focusing on what you need to do. So, um, you know, whereas, you know, if you go to a commercial gym, do they have childcare there? Is that a realistic thing? I don't know. Um, again, as somebody without kids, I don't feel like I can speak to this too well um, from a firsthand experience uh, point of view, but do take that into consideration to just consider it at least. Do think about that. Do you like people? If you like people, then you know the the down one of the big downsides that I have with a commercial gym might be a pro for you. Uh, if you don't like people, then uh, a home gym might be great. And so that's me. But there's enough other things about it that I don't like. It's the equipment. Um, it's also um, the the space that it occupied and working around it. It's space that I wanted to use for something else. I also like I like the act of getting in a car, going somewhere, making it feel like an event. And if it's just like, well time to work out. Let's go in the garage. It just doesn't, ha doesn't have the same feel. For me, it's largely um, equipment driven. However, quality of equipment and just variety in equipment as well. So um, let's see. Shall we just dive into uh, some recommendations here? Let's uh, let's talk about some, some really practical things to consider before we start going deep, deep, deep into all the equipment recommendations. So First up, things to consider. Um, how practical is this from a big picture standpoint? A lot of the things that we just talked about, also the space. Um, is that a space that you know could conceivably be used for something else? If you have a significant other, do they have designs on that space for some other purpose? Is it going to be a shared multi-purpose space? Are you going to have to move gym equipment out of the way so that somebody can have a painting studio or something like that? Um, is it supposed to be a shop? Uh, and you know, if you're building something, are you going to have a ton of crap to move out of the way? Are you going to have to put your classic Aston Martin out in the elements in the driveway instead of in the garage? You know, that would be tragic. I'd say maybe not, not a good choice. So things to consider there. Um, how high is your ceiling? Also this, if you're in a standard, you know, U S residential space constructed with eight foot ceilings. Um, most gym equipment will work in there, but you may encounter some limitations and some difficulties. Um, I had a rack before that had an add on that would have broken the eight foot barrier. So, um, my garage has 10 foot ceilings, um, which is not horrendously uncommon, but you do want to check and make sure. So just as you're scouting out the space, check ceiling height. And if it's eight foot, just keep that in the back of your mind when you're shopping for stuff and look at really, really take careful stock of the dimensions on things that you're looking to buy. Um, where is it? Um, so it says here, location, flooring, live load in engineering parlance. You have a dead load and a live load as far as determining the capacity that something can hold. The dead load is just the load of the structure itself. And um, in some cases, that will also include like there, there's a, uh, an add-on for that to account for, you know, typical furniture or something like that. Well, keep in mind, you're adding a lot of weight. And so that's your live load. And especially if you're going to be like dropping stuff. If you are not on a concrete slab, it needs to be taken into consideration. Realistically, I would say pretty much every gym should be on a concrete slab if you're going to be moving any kind of weight around at all or having any equipment other than just some dumbbells or something like that. So you want to be on a slab, ground floor, and that's that. Um, do you have climate control in here? Do you have heating and air conditioning? Consider where you are. Consider how livable the outside is throughout the course of a typical year. Are there going to be months where the gym in your garage, which is not air conditioned or heated, is it going to be usable at all? Or is it like, well, December and January, I can't really work out, you know, because it's 40 below outside. My garage isn't heated. And that's that. Like, don't, put yourself in unnecessarily horrific circumstances just to say like, I've got a home gym. Like if you're my, my take on it also is if you're going to have a home gym, it should be usable 12 months out of the year. Otherwise, you know, you're, you're really, really uh, decreasing the value of your investment. But if you're, if there's, you know, one fifth of the year where you're not able to use it, it's 20% of the time. It's like, it's a pretty big chunk of time. You're not able to use something that you're spending a lot of money on. So it's like having a vacation house, and if you're uh, if you're in, if you're the kind of person who has a vacation house, then your home gym bu budget probably isn't a massive concern. But otherwise, for the rest of us out there, think about it. Think about it. Uh, budget, of course, plays into that as well. So let's start here. We're going to do this. Uh, we're going to do order of operations. This is in the order of what I think is the most important thing or the most important stuff to have in your home gym. So number one, what do you think number one is? Any guesses? You're thinking like dumbbells or squat rack, barbell, BOSU ball. What is it? 
cardio, piece of cardio equipment, something that that's something that I think pretty much everybody could benefit from. So it, under this circumstance, under this definition, I have a home gym because I have a spin bike out in the garage like that. I will sacrifice some floor space for hundred percent. Absolutely worth it. Uh, just at, at this point, you know, if I need to do cardio, once I got out of my twenties, I was in a position where I knew I was never going to go to the gym just to do fasted cardio. It was just no longer a thing. I, I, it was a, an idea I was no longer willing to entertain. It's like, I got too much shit to do. I'm not going to go spend 15 minutes, drive to the gym to do 30 minutes of cardio and drive back. I'm spending 50% of my time doing the stuff that I need to do. I have too much to do. That's not going to work. That doesn't fly. So now I wake up, throw on my shoes, garage, bike, done, get to work. Um, so having a piece of cardio equipment at home, um, you're going to need to do cardio and having the ability to not be reliant on the weather. Once again, if you're like, I'll just go run outside. Does it ever rain where you live? Is it ever cold? Is it ever too hot? I've got clients who live in Arizona. They're like, we can't go outside. Like <laughs> I can't even go walk outside. It's 116 degrees. So know where you are, understand those limitations and understand that wherever you are, having the ability to do some cardio inside is going to be helpful. Um, so uh, consider your preference versus what's practical um, as far as like the type of equipment that you get. I would recommend in this order, bike, elliptical, rowing machine, treadmill. I put treadmill last there simply for maintenance issues. Um, a treadmill motor is going to be, especially for a residential grade piece of equipment, is going to be the thing that probably requires the most maintenance. Um, ellipticals, uh, you know, they have electronics in them as well. I had an elliptical that got pretty heavy use for several years and it never really, never really gave me any fits. I put the bike first just because a spin bike is a dumb piece of equipment. It has no intelligence on it. You know, I'm not talking a Peloton. I'm talking like get yourself a $200 spin bike off of Amazon. That's it. And then throw an iPad on it and a holder if you want to, and you can rig up a, uh, a lame, uh, Peloton knockoff if you want to. Um, but a, a regular spin bike, it just has mechanical friction. It has no electronics in it. It can't die. Like it can squeak. The pedals can need to be replaced. I've had to replace the pedals on mine a couple of times. 15 bucks, great, easy. So a spin bike is just the mo The thing is, in your home gym, you are the service crew. You're going to be maintaining all this stuff. So I think it's, it's important to factor that in when you're doing this and getting things that are going to require the least amount of, least amount of maintenance. Don't buy smart things. Buy the dumbest thing you possibly can. No stairs. No stairs. If, you, if you've been in gyms enough time, you know that stair mills are the thing that most commonly say out of order. They're maintenance headaches. They're expensive to upkeep. They're huge also. Um, a stairmaster stair mill is huge, and you just don't want that. Uh, so avoid the headache of that. Next up, what's next in our order of operations? Any guesses? Some low-hanging fruit here. This one is pretty obvious. Dumbbells, I think. If you're going to get one thing, get a set of dumbbells. Uh, one thing beyond a piece of cardio equipment get a set of dumbbells. So I would go with selectorized dumbbells all the way. This would be like Bowflex Select Tech dumbbells, although there are numerous brands that have become available. Um, Rep Fitness is one that is relatively new that was not available when I was looking for things back in 2020. Um, they have a handful of different options there. These um, are typically going to be dumbbells that have um, like dials on the end where you dial in the weight that you want, the dumbbell sitting in a cradle and you pick up the dumbbell and whatever weight you've dialed in um, determines how much of the weight in that cradle it actually picks up. So they're pretty smart devices. Most of them are fairly durable, although I still wouldn't get in the habit of dropping them on the floor or anything like that. Like the, the Bowflex ones, they still have a lot of plastic on them. That plastic will break. So just be careful with it. Um, and consider the, um, the heaviest dumbbell that you might need and order um, a set of selectorized dumbbells that surpass that. I said here by 20%. That's kind of arbitrary. Um, you want to give yourself room to grow. You don't want, and again, this is about having a home gym that's set up for um, a lack of compromise. Like we, we, you need to make compromises on budget, space, quality, but you don't want to make compromises on your exercise selection. And so you don't want to be in a position like, well, I guess I just can't do three point rows because I can handle a 90 pound dumbbell and my dumbbells only go up to 45. 
Like that's pretty ridiculous. So if you can handle a 90 pound three point row, you need a set of dumbbells that go well past 45. Now, maybe they, they aren't going to hit your max for everything, but they should be able to hit your max and beyond it for most things for sure. So give yourself room to grow. Um, if you can get a selectorized set that goes in two and a half pound increments, that's awesome. It can be tricky. Most of the ones that have a higher capacity, like I think Rep Fitness had one that goes to 66, one that goes to 88, something like that. Those are typically going to go in five pound increments. If you find a set that goes up to 25 or 35, 45, those will often go in, in smaller increments, like two and a half pound jumps. Um, so it just depends on what you need. Um, what I had were the um, Bowflex Select Tech 90s, um, which I found um, on Facebook Marketplace for a good price. Um, they came with a stand, which was awesome. And actually, I got a bench from that guy too. So, um, and that was like April 2020. Like, <laughs> peak pandemic times, gyms closing down. And this guy's like, I just don't want my home gym stuff anymore. He could have sold it for twice what he did if he would have waited another month. Um, but uh, lucky for me, he didn't. So, uh, yeah, uh, dumbbells, really key. I, I would strongly advise not going with just standard dumbbells, like a set of fives, a set of tens, a set of fifteens. I do think there could be some value. If you get a set of selectorized dumbbells that do have options for 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, I think there could be some value in um, down the road. I wouldn't do it right away. Picking up sets of actual dumbbells that are in those two and a half pound increment gaps. Like get yourself a pair of 12 and a half, a pair of 17 and a half, a pair of 22 and a half, um, up to 27 and a half, and then I'd probably stop there. Um, so, you know, what is that? 12, 17, 22, 22, the four sets of dumbbells on top of your selectorized set would be pretty comprehensive. And at that point, you're rivaling the capacity of what most commercial gyms have. The downside of selectorized dumbbells is they're typically huge. And so, you know, you'll lock it in for five pounds or whatever. And you've got this giant empty five pound husk that's not holding any weight, um, but it's kind of unwieldy. And, you know, you think of the size of a normal five pound dumbbell. It's like three times that size. Um, like the weights there, it's just, it's a physically larger thing. It's a little cumbersome. Sometimes on some movements, the dumbbell can kind of get in the way. Just the size of the dumbbell can get in the way of how you perform the exercise. So it's one of those considerations you just have to take into account. I think it's worth it. And I think if you've got the ability to find a used set here, that's going to be a lot more bang for your buck. And one thing I would note here is kind of like an overarching from the top, don't forget this, is that everybody hires a coach, starts a workout program, starts a diet, whatever, and quits in two weeks. The amount of used gym equipment for sale all the time is massive. So if you're looking for something very specific and you look online and you don't see it for sale used, wait two weeks and look again. Be patient as you're doing this. Be the bargain hunter, but look used. Check, is Craigslist still a thing? I don't know. Check Facebook Marketplace. Um, hell, go to state sales or whatever. You can find all kinds of crazy crap somewhere. Um, or just, you know, other Facebook groups, et cetera. Um, you can also look for um, wholesale. If, if gyms are going out of business, um, oftentimes their stuff will be available for wholesale. Um, I used to see those ads on Craigslist quite a bit, actually. So, um, and I've no, I've worked, I've had several clients that I've worked with who have outfitted their home gym, like the entire basement of their house. They've just built what looks like a commercial gym down there with all the stuff that they got from a liquidated, uh, commercial gym. So you've got like, yeah, this is my selectorized shoulder press machine. This is my pec deck. <laughs> so just have all this stuff that they got. I'm like, nice setup. Nice setup. Still wouldn't want to dedicate that much of my house to it, but okay. You do you next up in our order of operations here bands. So again, we're going for the, the easy stuff, the little things here. Each step up in this is a commitment of some additional space and resources. And bands at this point make the most sense because they don't bring a lot of utility, but they're so stinking cheap. And if we just get dumbbells and bands and we stop there, we can do a lot of stuff, right? Th this right here, this point is what I consider to be the, the minimum first tier if you're gonna be operating a home gym. You've got a piece of cardio equipment, you've got a comprehensive set of dumbbells, you've got a set of bands, awesome. When I say bands, um, not my favorite by any stretch, pun intended, yes. Um, it, it gives you a, a lot more vocabulary that you can play from. Now you can do simulated cable exercises with bands. Um, you can simulate some machine exercises, like you can do banded leg exercises like extension and curls. They're not great, but it's better than not being able to do it at all. 
So you can still get some stimulus in the muscle this way. Just don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. If you're going for a tier one home gym, and again, I would consider this to be the cutoff point for that, you're going to have to make some compromises. And it's not something for somebody that has serious goals, I would not recommend a tier one home gym as your stopping point for that. But for, for clients that I work with, this is the minimum. I say as far as home gyms go, if you have this, I can work with you. Otherwise, upgrade. Um, so what we're looking for here are two different types of bands. We want some loop style bands. These are the kind that you use for assisted pull-ups. Usually you can get a pack of those on Amazon, you know, often in four or five different um, tension amounts for 30 bucks, 35 bucks, something like that. And then um, a set of surgical tubing bands that have clips on the end and they'll also come with handles. And then you can use those like stand on the middle of the band. You can do curls with those. You can do other exercises as well. So it gives you a lot more flexibility that way for sure. Um, and you can get a set of those for 25 bucks. So, um, and then one other thing that is not on this list, but that I would consider is in your permanent home gym space, um, building some attachment points, um, like finding a stud on the wall, um, building a board, like, like an attachment board. You can see these plans. If you, if you search on YouTube, you'll find people with, um, uh, ideas on how to build attachment boards for bands. Um, they just have a series of clips on them that you can, um, uh, that you can uh, hook a loop style band through or that you can clip a tubing band to. So um, something like that would be great. Um, I actually just went and put a couple of bike hooks in strategic spots in my garage and outside that I could throw bands around and that worked for me when I had to use it. Next up, moving from bands. Next thing would be an adjustable bench. This probably should actually be in, in, the, in the first tier as well. Because uh, a set of dumbbells are only going to take you so far if you don't have a bench where you can do some seated and some incline and some flat bench exercises on them. So the main thing I would tell you here is do not skimp on this. You're also probably going to use this as a step, at least for a little bit. So you want it to be sturdy, uh, stable, and large enough to support you. Some benches are just really tiny. They're super narrow, chintzy. Um, some options that I put in here, you've got a Titan um, option. They have benches that range from about 215 bucks all the way up to almost 500. Um, rep is a little bit up from that, 270 to 600. Rogue starts at 600. And as I put, they are overpriced as usual. I would never buy anything Rogue, um, personally. Very high quality, much higher quality than you will need in a commercial gym. Like it's built for commercial use and you simply do not need it. And you are paying a lot for the brand name and don't unless you really want to for some reason. Um, there's some <laughs> cheap Amazon shit for a hundred bucks or less in the bench category. You do get, you do get what you pay for. Personally, I wouldn't pay less than 200 bucks for a bench. Um, if you do, you do so at your own peril. Um, and I think you're going to be using this for enough stuff. Like it's going to be your your primary captain's chair from which you you control everything that goes on in your gym. So it's where you'll sit between breaks when you're taking a rest. Uh, it's a writing surface that you'll use for everything. You're going to use it for a ton of exercises, a step. Um, you will uh, kneel on it and cry when your spouse leaves you. Uh, you will use this for so many things, so many things. If you're really lucky, you'll have a small dog that will want to jump up on the bench and you can pet it while it's up there as well. You want little Fido to have a nice sturdy bench to sit on. So um, you can't, you can't over, uh, oversell the importance of a high quality bench. Next up, Olympic bar and plates. Uh, I did say, feel free to skimp here. <laughs> you absolutely can skimp on your Olympic bar and plates. Now you can find some stuff on what's that site? T Timu <laughs> where, where you can probably find an Olympic bar for $17. I wouldn't buy that because that thing will break on you. I guarantee it. Um, but anything that you find, like any standard seven foot Olympic bar is going to fit the bill. It's fine. Um, it does need to be an Olympic bar, not a standard bar. So keep in mind, if you're new to this, there is a huge difference between an Olympic bar and a standard bar. And you need to get plates that match the type of bar that you're buying. So it's about the diameter at the end of the bar or the diameter in the center of the plate. So Olympic is two inch, standard is one inch. The standard is just cheap. It's cheap, it's shitty, it's lower quality. Um, Olympic, you're gonna have higher quality options for everything, and they will universally fit on everything. We're gonna look at some additional pieces of equipment here that would be plate loaded later on. All those are gonna use Olympic plates. So you don't wanna be stuck in a position where like, oh, I've got some standard plates and some Olympic plates. Like that's the rookie mistake that everybody makes. So settle on one, pick one, but pick Olympic and stick with it. Just pretend that standard doesn't even exist. Um, 
if you can squat 155 pounds, you don't need a $300 barbell. Like what you're buying with that are things that only a seasoned powerlifter is going to appreciate. Um, you're buying higher weight capacity. You're paying more for maybe a slightly more aggressive knurling pattern. Um, you know, you're paying for more of a custom finish, that kind of thing. Uh, if you want that, fine. You don't need it. Like skimp, save some money here. Save some money on this. Also, um, a lot of people sell bars assuming that they are going to be done for CrossFit activities like cleans, um, jerks, snatches, etc., and then dropped. And if you're if you're watching this video, I, I, I don't I don't think or, or listening to this podcast, I don't think this podcast is super popular among CrossFitters. I can't imagine because I talk a lot of shit about CrossFitters. I don't know why you'd want to put yourself through that. Like, I'm going to listen to this podcast from this guy who clearly hates me. Like, not on a personal level, but still. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're listening to this and you're, you're buying into, like, my methodology for training, etc., we don't need to purchase a barbell that we're going to drop on the floor. That's not how we, not how we work shit here. So I wouldn't worry about that. Um, a plate is a plate, meaning they don't have to be all matchy-matchy. They can be different. They can be different, slightly different diameters, different colors, etc. Doesn't matter. I would say you want to have a set of 45s that match each other. Uh, and then from there, it doesn't matter. So c consider like what the, the standard, um, th the standard uh, configuration would be for plates, like a pair of each a pair of 45s. Do not buy 35s ever for any circumstance ever ever, ever. 35 pound plates don't exist. Do not buy a 35 pound plate. If you buy a 35 pound plate, I will demand that you unsubscribe to this podcast. You stop watching this video right now. Don't do it. We can't be friends. That's it. 35 pound plates are among the most useless objects on planet earth and they need to all just die in a fire or be shot into the sun. We don't want them. Don't don't want them. I bought one once. Again, early days of the pandemic. <clears throat> Why did I buy it? It was the only plate I could find for sale anywhere. I'm like, it's better than nothing. Guess what? It wasn't. It wasn't better than nothing. I used it once. And then two days later, I found a guy who had a bunch of weights in a barn. And guess what? None of them were 35s. I never used that 35 pound plate again. I think it might still be out in my garage. Even after I've unloaded everything else, everybody else is like, yeah, I don't want that. No. Oh, it's free. Mm, no, thanks. No, I'll pay you to take it. No, thanks. No, thanks. Say no to 35 pound plates. Point here being mix and match. Get your plates used from different sources. That's fine. Get a pair of 45s, a pair of 25s. I might get four tens, maybe four fives, a couple of two and a halves. Call it good. Next up um, would be a half rack with a pull-up bar. Um, so the pull-up bar in this is um, partially what we want to do is be able to attach some bands to it and other things. Even if you're not doing pull-ups, we will get some utility from having that bar up there and we can utilize that. Uh, so let's talk here a little bit about a half rack versus a full rack versus a squat stand. Um, a half rack is two vertical supports connected with a horizontal member or two or three. Um, so it's freestanding. Um, it's reasonably well supported. Um, if you're working on an 800 pound squat, I wouldn't necessarily do that on a half rack just because it's not going to be that stable. Um, but for almost everything that, uh, most standard human beings are going to do a half rack is more than sufficient. A full rack attaches, uh, or it adds on two additional vertical supports and some additional horizontal bracing. So it's more of a contained cage at that point. Um, and you can actually squat inside it. This will have bailout bars. So this is kind of like the real deal. Um, you can find a half rack that has um, that has bailout bar attachments, but generally speaking, the physics of that are not not really uh, sound. Uh, like it's very easy for that thing if you use that to then just topple over, depending on how big the bailout bars are and how far away from the center of mass of that thing that the bar lands if it has to hit. Um, still might be better than nothing, but eh. 
I would just like be careful and work within what you know to be your your good working range. Um, and then a squat stand is going to be like a half rack, but you just have typically it's two pieces that aren't necessarily connected to one another. So they're just two freestanding barbell cradles with some supports that sit out in space, um, which can be a totally uh, viable um, thing to use. And usually they're adjustable in height as well. So you could put your bench under it, lower them way down, and probably bench from that as well. Um, so you got some options there. Uh, I would recommend a half rack just for the versatility of it. If you've got the the space for a full rack, that's great. Again, it doesn't need to be some 1,200 pound capacity type thing. You can skimp on this. You you can skimp on this as well. We, we just need something that gets the bar off the ground. It doesn't have to bake bread for you or anything like that. I made the mistake when I was doing this, when I was outfitting my home gym, of getting a full rack, which was fine. Um, I had the space for it. It was, it did get to be a little intrusive. And my wife was very much like, you aren't using this thing. You're back in the gym now. When are we going to sell this thing? Cause it made a, but the position of it made it hard for her to get in and out of her uh, passenger side of her car. So we had to do this little song and dance where, you know, if somebody's getting the passenger side, we got to back out of the garage first, then we get in. So it's just, it was too big. It was too big. But I made the mistake also of buying one because it had options that you could put on the sides of it where you bolt on these cable things. So it had wings and then you could do a cable crossover on there and they were adjustable. They went up and down. They had plate loaded um, pegs on the side. So you could load up um, those two wing uh, cable attachments. Problem was they were just not smooth. They were not very usable. So I would not, if you find something like that, be very skeptical about that. Also, it was fairly cheap and inexpensive. And yeah, I mean, for a rack, it was fine. When you start throwing in the other stuff, it also had like a, a pull down and row attachment for the inside of it. Also low quality, not great, not fan. Um, and so you start throwing all that stuff on there when it's a cheap rack to begin with, it wasn't a good option. So um, Titan has uh, a lot of great options here. And also, you know, if there's a conversion kit that will take it from a half rack to a full rack, can consider that for down the road as well. So you leave yourself um, some some open doors that way. Next up, um, so a budget option here would be a rack pulley system. Now you can get this, it's like 50 to 70 bucks on Amazon. It clips into the pull-up bar or one of the um, horizontal cross member supports on your rack and uh, allows it has a strap and a pulley and then there's a loading pin and then you can attach handles to it. So this would allow you to do like tricep push downs, lat pull downs, etc. Any kind of vertical pull is now an option for you. Now it is super janky. It is extremely ghetto, but it works. Ain't the greatest thing in the world, but it works. It's something. Again, it opens up a vocabulary of exercises that you couldn't do otherwise. And when you're in a home gym space, that's incredibly valuable. Now it is the crappiest way to do it, but also it's 50 bucks. So like that's pretty reasonable, right? Um, most of these kits, they do come with multiple attachments. Like they'll have a couple of single handles. They'll have a rope attachment, probably a straight bar or something like that. Um, keep in mind, uh, the range of motion on this might be a little bit of an issue. Um, this is usually somewhat adjustable, uh, based on the, the, configuration of the cable going through the pulley. Some of these kits come with ability to the ability to adjust the length of it, but you might find a situation where it's like, well, I have to sit my butt down on the floor to do this. And it's kind of tough to get in the right uh, range of motion. Cause otherwise if you're going for that deep stretch, your plates are going to hit the floor, you know, that kind of thing. So there could be some logistical issues now. Um, the other thing though, to consider if that's 50 to 70 bucks, well, for 200 bucks or less, you can do a plate loaded pull down and row station which is pretty cool. Um, I bought one of these from Amazon and that one is no longer available, but it was around 400, I think. And now they've got a lot of additional options that are pretty cheap. Um, as it says here, the, the last bullet point, for the love of God, read reviews. And here's the thing. I'm going to give you some insight here into the culture of reviews for gym equipment. And I don't know why this is, but this is how it goes. 80% of all the reviews you're going to read are about putting the thing together. Now, I'm going to assume that most fully functional human beings 
are going to be able to figure out how to put this stuff together, even though the instructions for some of this stuff is very questionable at best. It doesn't come with the greatest of instructions. But you look at the picture, like I've ordered some things before, and like it doesn't really come with a good picture on the front of the instruction manuals, but you go to Amazon, you pull up the product photo, and you're like, okay, I see what they're talking about here. Oh, yeah, I see those bolts there. Okay, gotcha, all right. Now you can You can figure it out, right? I tell you what, though. Some of the people, like, I'm wondering, like, how did you manage to turn on your computer and get to this page where you can leave a review? Like, there there are some real um, special people writing some of these reviews out there. Man. So, you got to figure, like, if they're selling this thing, it is possible to put it together. I have faith in you that you can figure it out. So... Forget that crap, all those reviews, and focus on the ones that actually talk about how the equipment works. Um, because as I mentioned, there can be wide swings in quality of equipment just ranging from, yeah, the pulleys here aren't very smooth, or actually the range of motion, this is really built for short people, being taller, it's like, eh. So you'll find some good reviews like that. Read through those before you drop any money on stuff, any home equipment um, for your gym. Uh, always read that stuff. Um, so the pull down row station though, it has a really good compact footprint. It's got a lot of utility. Like you can do all kinds of various rows, all kinds of various pull downs. You can, you know, it's not ideal, but you can work some tricep stuff in on this as well. Um, and uh, in free weight programs, like back training is just weak. Like there's only so much you can do with barbells and dumbbells for back um, and having some more comprehensive options for just a little bit more footprint if you've got the space for it and a pretty minimal investment, like 200, 250 bucks. That's pretty good. So um, this would be as far as like specialized equipment that we're talking about. This would be the first thing that I would recommend picking up, you know, an extra piece of equipment that's going to require dedicated floor space just for a handful of exercises. This is worth it. This is where I'd go. So the next one in the same category of things that are going to require more floor space and have limited use would be a leg extension, leg curl combo. A lot of these, a lot of these. So you want to get one that is plate loaded. It's going to be a side load, not a unicorn style load. By that, I mean, like if you're sitting there doing a leg extension, we've all seen these things. Like you can buy them at Sears probably. Is Sears still around? How old am I? Take a guess. Guess in the comments. How old am I? where you're sitting there and like the plate is loaded in front of you and there's this peg sticking out the front um, that looks like a unicorn horn and you put your usually standard size plates on that. You don't want, you want one that's loaded from the side um, and there should be, uh, I call it a Swiss cheese flywheel that will um, dictate um, the range of motion this thing has. So this is how it's adjustable between a uh, curl, which is a pull and an extension, which is really a push exercise. Um, or an extension versus a flexion exercise. It can do both based on the position of the flywheel. It's really easy to adjust. Once you know, you just got to take the little loading pin and like flip it around 180 degrees or 360 degrees almost um, to put it in a position where it will support flexion instead of extension. So um, you can find these for 250 to 500 bucks. I think the one that I got from Titan was like 450. I'm not sure what the price on theirs is now. Again, if you go to Amazon, there's a lot of options that have come around in the past couple of years that weren't available when I was shopping for this stuff. And they all look pretty reasonable, realistically. Um, like the reviews on them are pretty solid. Um, and for 250 bucks, like it's a no brainer. So now um, with inflation being what it is, it's kind of crazy. Um, the, the money that I spent on my lap pull down station I could get a station similar to that and an extension curl combo now. So home gym equipment has really come down in price. The, the quality might not be the same, but it's probably good enough, realistically. It doesn't have to be amazing as long as it's good enough. And that Titan extension curl that I had was definitely good enough. It, it, did, the, it did the trick. It did the trick nicely. So uh, next up, so again, more footprint, little increase in cost this time. But if you're, if you're going ham, and you really want to build like the most kick-ass home gym that all the cool kids from your neighborhood are going to want to come over after school and play with, you're going to want a leg press hack squat combo in there as well. So now I bought one of these. I bought the body solid one that was like $1,300 delivered on a pallet, free shipping, by the way. <laughs> Somebody got suckered into that deal. Like they had to unload it with a forklift off the truck. Um, and funny note, Funny note, I ordered that in, I want to say May of 2020. It was three weeks ago 
that I finally got rid of the wood from that pallet. Here in, uh, that would have been uh, back half of July 2024. It took me four years plus to get rid of the wood from that pallet. It's just been sitting outside the garage weathering all that time. And my wife's like, hey, I love you, but love has limits. When is that going away? I'm like, oh, yeah, about that. Not today. Not today. Not today. Well, guess what, sweetie? I love you too. It's gone. So there we go. It's my... uh anniversary present for next year. Anyway, point being, uh, there's a lot more options available beyond that body solid combina- a lot body solid combo unit, um, which uh, it looks all, all looks very comparable. I would say the things that I found now, they're in like the 575 to $700 range, which is ridiculous for the versatility and the functionality that this brings. Um, they're all reasonably well-reviewed. And again, a lot, of the, a lot of the reviews we're talking about assembly. I tell you what, I wanted to leave a review on that body solid unit about its assembly um, because it realistically needed three people to assemble it. We did it with two, but we both almost died. Um, like it was extremely difficult, (laughs) extremely difficult. There was one piece of it that was about 50% of the weight of the whole machine and you had to lift it in place and then bolt it to things while you were still supporting the weight. There was no other way to do it. Um, and like I said, we both almost died. So, um, it was very difficult. Uh, these seem like a little bit easier. Uh, be mindful here. Consider the footprint and the need for probably a lot more plates as you load this thing up. Yes. Um, But also, uh, I think it would be um, worth looking at the reviews and really kind of going over the photos with a fine tooth comb and looking at like how big the foot plates are, both for the hack squat and for the leg press. So you're going to be, you know, facing up um, when you're in the leg press position and facing down when you're in a hack squat position. They have pads that move in place or out of place, depending on whether you need them. Um, But look at where your foot are positioned and just see, look at where your feet are positioned. If you really are... um, digging deep, you might find some um, videos, uh, some reviews that have videos attached, which would be great because then you can actually see it in motion. I would look for that, but there's a lot of options here that just weren't available again when I was looking for this stuff, which, you know, if I was looking to outfit a home gym right now, I'd have a much better time of it than I did back in the pandemic era when, again, there were fewer options. Everything was more expensive in this field for some reason, and everything was out of stock. (laughs) You couldn't find anything. It was painful. Next up, At this point, we're going to take a detour from equipment and focus on some other things. And the first thing that I would say here would be flooring. Um, So again, we are probably in a um, building in a house, a room that's on a slab. This is probably a garage, I would imagine, or a basement. Um, Protecting the flooring would be great. And it's one of those things like you could absolutely consider this beforehand and do this earlier as well. the uh, tip that I keep reading that comes up from everybody is tractor supply company, get horse stall mats um, and actually get them from there because otherwise like you can buy horse stall mats from Amazon and from places that sell fitness equipment. They're not going to be the same. They're not going to be as thick. They're probably going to be more expensive. Um, get them from tractor supply company. Apparently, you know, that that's, you know, go straight to the source. So, um, so it, pr- it protects the floor. Um, it's more forgiving on the floor and on you for load bearing exercises. Um, so your body will thank you for having a little bit of cushion and support. Um, and then also, you know, if you drop something, it's not a guaranteed break. So, you know, uh, <laughs> this could be like, you know, I wouldn't recommend having a glass out there that has your water in it. But if you do, great. You could drop a glass on a rubber mat and it's not a guaranteed break like it would be on a concrete slab. So um, flooring would be the next thing. Now, next up, I'm going to recommend a very specific piece of equipment. That's Dolby 5.1 surround system, or you could get a Dolby Atmos sound system and some stadium seating as well. Um, now, maybe you don't want all that. Maybe I'm just trying to make sure you're paying attention. Are you? Hello? Are you paying attention? But I would recommend um, a Bluetooth speaker of some sorts. And this is where you say, but Darren, there are things exist that exist called headphones. And I have some headphones. I don't need a speaker. To which I say, okay, calm down. Just chill out. Take a deep breath and hear me out. A speaker creates atmosphere. It gives your room a vibe. It gives your space a vibe. Headphones don't do that. 
Like it's 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 really it's kind of like the same end result, but it's not. It is different, and I would strongly recommend a speaker unless you're operating in a space where you have to be quiet. Like, oh, there's a sleeping baby in the next room, or I wake up at four in the morning and the rest of my house is still asleep. Eh, okay, that's fair. If it's not one of those, I would absolutely recommend getting a very, very decent, doesn't have to be huge, but a very decent speaker setup, Bluetooth setup. Um, and that's it. So I, you know, uh, my home gym that I had is also my workshop. Um, I'm a very, very amateur woodworker. And really what that means is I make shit for my wife to fit her needs. <laughs> like I need something that'll go here and hold this. What can you make me? Oh, let me see what I can do. Okay, here we go. Um, and I make frames for her artwork as well. Uh, and they're not fancy or anything like that. It's just, you know, a, a something that she can put a photo on and then paint over. So, um, but I do have the shop out there and in my shop, it's outfitted with, uh, Makita stuff. Um, as far as like my, my, uh, battery powered drills, et cetera. And so I have a Makita shop speaker that plugs into the wall or I can stick one of their speaker, one of their batteries in it and take it on the road and be, have it be portable with me as well. So, um, that thing, I mean, it's just, it's, it's like a tiny little boom box. It has a handle on it. You carry it around. Um, that's perfect. I mean, it's loud enough. Absolutely. Um, the sound is very decent. So something like that works great. Uh, I'm not saying you have to get a shop speaker, but some, something along those lines. You don't want to get, like I have in my bathroom for when I'm in the shower, I have a little speaker that's about the size of a shampoo bottle. That's a blue, like that's not going to do much for a gym space. Like, yeah, you'll be able to hear it, but it's going to be a very, very thin, hollow sound. You want something that has a little bit of depth and resonance to it. Not super bass heavy, but it needs to have a balanced sound, right? So that just means a larger speaker. So, um, yeah, so uh, sound, strong recommend, strong recommend. So little other things that you can get as add-ons here. Um, th this is where I'd start to consider like accessorizing your gym, a landmine attachment. Um, so you can get an attachment that will fit on um, the, their universal landmine attachments that will go on racks just to give it some place to secure. Um, you can also find just a standalone one that sits on the floor um, or has a uh, peg on the end of it that will stick in the middle of an Olympic plate. Uh, and this is basically so you can do a T-bar row, Meadows row, single arm barbell row, all that kind of stuff. Um, a single multi-sided plyo box can be great. One that is maybe 14 inches if you put it one way, 18 if you put it another way, and 20 or 22 if you put it another way. So something that has three different sizes on it would be a good addition here for step-ups, um, box squats, things of that nature. Um, an aerobic step with risers for things where you need a step, but maybe not quite as tall as the shortest side of the plyo box. So if you just need a six or an eight inch step, if you're doing, uh, elevated stationary lunges, for example, great, here you go. That's, that's where the aerobic step with risers comes in. I'd say an aerobic step and two pair of risers would be sufficient for that. Um, a belt for weighted dips and pull-ups, uh, assuming, you know, if, if you're capable of doing weighted dips and pull-ups. 100%. Um, a series of mag bar attachments or knockoffs. Now you can go on Amazon and there's a billion different brands that are all knockoffs of those um, coated um, iron handles. Um, just they're high quality grips. Um, they just feel better. Um, when I use those, I just feel like I'm more connected to the weight, which is very much kind of a foo foo woo woo kind of thing. But um, I totally buy into it. It's one of those things. It might be a little bit of a gimmick, but I'm sold on it. Like I, I find those highly effective and also fractional plates. So you can get like a series of one and a quarter um, pound plates so that you can go up on barbell exercises in two and a half pound increments as opposed to five. So now one more thing here. Um, number 12 would be like, Hey, before we get to a list of stuff that you absolutely don't need, let's just talk about one more thing that would really be in the like, Hey, if you want to have the really, really absolute coolest gym on the block, get yourself a dual access cable machine. So again, footprint cost, it's going to set you back a bit. It's going to be somewhere between 1500 to four grand for a reasonable one. Um, but this basically removes all barriers. You can now do pretty much everything that you might need to. Um, like you still don't have all the single use exercise machines. Like you don't have a shoulder press machine. You don't have a chest press machine, but now you can do like anything that you would want to have a cable for. You can do it. 
And uh, that there's a lot of value in that. Is it worth four grand? I don't know. Is it worth 15 to 1700? You know, if you're really serious about your home gym, I think it might be. I think it might be. Um, and it's just about finding the space and then finding the right one. There are a bunch of these, um, you know, free motion dual cross is, of course, the gold standard, but that's going to run you like 6,500 or something like that. It's, it's a commercial piece. It's very expensive. Um, you can find others. Some of them are plate loaded. Some of them are selectorized. So just be mindful of that. Um, I'm always a little bit more skeptical of the plate loaded ones just because I think they have the tendency for the cable mechanism in there to be just a little bit janky, a little bit more rough, not quite a little bit more frictiony, um, and not as smooth. So I would, I would probably steer clear of those and try and find a selectorized option. Um, and again, read the reviews, read the reviews. This just opens up so many opportunities as far as what you can do with your home gym. So, um, two slides now of stuff you don't need. Um, I will probably add very little commentary to this. So if you've been listening to this podcast long enough, you probably know what's on this list already. Okay. And really I'm, I'm including this stuff here just so that people don't say, Hey, what about this? I'm like, no, just no medicine balls, stability ball, Bosu ball, kettlebells, TRX. Hmm. I debated putting it on that list. I didn't put a TRX in the list of stuff that I think you need because I don't think it's essential by any stretch of the imagination. I don't hate it. I don't hate it. TV. This is another one of those. If you put a TV in your home gym, unsubscribe from the podcast right now. Stop watching the video. Turn it off. No TVs in the gym. Old man Darren has spoken. Weighted vest. No, no to the weighted vest. A sled. You need a sled. You're going to fuck up your own driveway? No, we don't need a sled. Rings. No. Chalk. Keep in mind, you have to clean this place up. Ab wheel. No. That's it. That's my list. That's all I got, dudes. It's been real. It's been fun. But was it all real fun? Thank you, Green Day. We'll be back next week, 270. I don't know what I'm going to talk about next week for 270. If you have any ideas, let me know. I'm open to them. Um, I, I'm in need of topics. Help. I'm drowning. I'm drowning here. Help. Help me out, please. Please. I need your support. Next week, I might have some wine before I record. That's a threat. Possibly a promise. I don't know. We'll see. Peace out. Catch you next week.